afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Today is October 23rd, and we are having a study session. And Maureen, could we please have a roll call? Mayor Mangarelli will be late. Mayor Pro Tem Orr? Here. Councilman Blair? Yes. Councilman Good? Here. Councilman Lamerson? Here. Councilwoman Scholl? Here. Councilman Siska? Here. All are present, although Mayor will be coming in later. And we will take public comment after each item. So, uh, Mr. Palladini, would you like to? I think, uh, Mr. Worth George, is okay, the very good. Thank you. Hello, George, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. I'm gonna run through just a little bit of background about our temporary sign code requirements as they are in the code today, and some things that led up to a uh, proposal that we're working on towards amending them, perhaps but at least taking them on to the next step in the review process. Back in 2015, um, some of you will recall this because we came to council quite a bit at that time to talk to you, uh, Supreme Court decision rendering um, reaffirmation of requirements for sign codes not involving the content of the sign, so it's content neutral, uh, came out. Um, what it did was it, it caused most cities in the country to reevaluate their sign codes. Uh, some significant changes to um, sign codes have been enacted across the state, across the country, as a result of that action. Again, the focus was you can't use the content of the sign, the message of the sign, as part of your regulation. You can regulate the time that a sign is up, the place that a sign can go, or the manner that speech is presented, but you can't regulate the speech. <coughs> Our sign code previously, um, much like most other sign codes in the state and much of the rest of the United States, differentiated types of temporary signs by what they said. Temporary signs such as a campaign sign or a yard sale sign were treated differently from one another, and that's based on the content of the sign. So we had to revise our code to take that out. The last thing we want to do is to have a set of sign regulations in place that effectively fly in the face of the constitutional protections of free speech. So we revised our sign code, adopted a whole new series of requirements. One of the things that we did in that process was to establish limits on temporary signs, sizes and how many in some cases. When those things were put in place, there were some consequences that occurred a little bit later along that triggered council to consider a moratorium on the enforcement of it until we can relook at or reconsider some of those things. And I'll address those as we step through this. Our current regulations have, again, specific limitations or requirements. For non-residential properties, so this is commercial signage, you're allowed one temporary sign per business, and there's a maximum square footage of 24 square feet. So that's a f fairly large sign uh, by temporary or sign are standards. You, uh open to have people ask you questions while you're doing it? Absolutely, sir. Just so we can lay the groundwork for the discussion? Certainly. So what you're saying is that we, the government, the heavy hand, have decided to tell people on their private property what they can and can't do and how long and all that, right? Yes, sir. Thank you. That is exactly what ordinances do. We also placed a 180-day time limit on how long an individual temporary sign could be up. You're calling it a temporary sign. How long can it be temporary? So, George, can I stop you for a second? Certainly. Please define temporary. That was part of what we were doing with that ordinance. So a temporary sign is one that is not a, intended to stay up permanently year-round. It is a less rigid type of sign, something that isn't intended for its l longevity, its lifespan, to make it through a full year. So a banner. A banner is a great example. The small uh, for sale signs that a lot of times you'll see, the little signs for yard sale signs, those types of signs generally are temporary. They're not manufactured to last an entire year or longer. Permanent signage, especially on commercial property, lasts for years. It, it's intended to and does survive five, 10 years or more. So we place the 180 
30-day time limit on commercial signage specifically because if it's temporary, how long is temporary? Yes, it's an arbitrary number, but you have to pick a number. What distinguishes between what you consider a sign and what I consider art? Usually, and again, by our own definitions, a sign represents some form of what a business does. A bicycle so you're shop with a specifically targeting businesses. You're not specifically targeting um, you know, I might consider one thing a form of art, you might consider it a sign, and you know, at what level am I willing to tolerate you telling me <clears throat> how long I can have a piece of what I would consider art in my store or on my window. And according to your ordinance that wants to prohibit me from the freedom of expression. It limits, it doesn't necessarily prohibit. Anytime you take away my ability to display, you are prohibiting, you're, you're limiting my ability to express. So George, would you like to go through a couple of things and then we'll do a timeout for questions or we can do can that keep it moving yeah. okay um again for commercial signage we're only talking commercial at this point which which mr lammers is correct we we only regulate signs on the outside of the building so if it's something inside the building we don't regulate it if it has an, nothing to do with the business being um displaying it then generally it's considered art so if you run a bicycle shop and you paint bicycles on the side of your building, it's a sign. If you paint a donut on the side of your building, it's not. It, it's related to a message about the conduct of the business. Very convoluted. All that censorship in any shape, manner, form, George? No, sir. Come on. <laughs> the donut so, man is going to get penalized, but not the bicycle guy, or vice versa, right? If the donut <laughs> guy wants to paint a bicycle on his shop, I think that's quid pro quo. Looks great. <laughs> The, the, the message of the sign, though, is not what we regulate. It's the size. It's the location. It's where it goes. Those are the key points. For temporary signs on residential property, council took an entirely different tact. There's no limitation on the number of signs that a residential property can have. There's only a limitation on the size of the individual sign. The intent there was to not allow for a, a huge coverage of temporary signs that would stay up all year for various things, whether it's a campaign during campaign season or whether it's yard sales during the summer when they're popular or whatever it may be. The idea was that the individual signs were smaller. It was a compromise. There was a proposal that was discussed by council at the time to limit the total number of signs by square footage on a lot, not just the individual size of each individual sign. So you could have had maximum of six square feet, but a maximum of 24 for the property, which would limit you to four signs if they were at the full size. Uh, five foot height limitation, again, uh, determination made based on typical size and locations of signs. Temporary signs generally aren't taller than five feet in height. No time limits. So you could put signs out. You could put a sign out supporting a candidate or an item on an agenda. You could put signs out supporting um, a local business. Uh, again, residential signs. We're not looking at the content of the sign for the regulation purposes. It could be mounted on a wall. It could be freestanding. Um, we didn't require any permitting under the code. That's on residential private property. So again, on commercial property, we limit the number and the size. On residential property, only the size of the individual sign, no limitation on the number, no limitation on the total square footage of sign allowed. What was it thinking of tra treating residential different than business? A lot of the, a lot of the determinations that have been made over the years in district and at the Supreme Court on signage have treated individual property owner freedoms and free speech rights differently than commercial speech. There is a higher standard held to regulating individual free speech than there is to commercial free speech. In, in doing that, the residential properties, generally when a, a property owner puts signs out, he's representing or supporting something. He's supporting candidates or items on an agenda or a, a ballot. 
If maybe, he's supporting ballot items, George, sir. that may be, maybe you're treating them all the same. I mean, I may put a sign out in front of my business that says Jesus forever. Now you want to regulate that. I'm just sharing it with you. Yes, sir. And again, the way the ordinance is set up, we would treat your business sign, temporary sign, differently than if you put the same sign in your front yard. That's correct. So I can put a sign from Shiska's Olson's Grain in my yard, one from Lamerson's Business in my yard. There, there are, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Right, I was just going to say there are other types of regulations that also apply to, to signs. Remember at the very beginning I mentioned there are three things you can do. There's time, place, and manner. Well, the place means that you can regulate whether it's an off-site sign or not. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it's um, um, just carte blanche. Did you want to fill any more on that, Mr. Bellini? Yeah, you know, just to be clear, um, the, we do ban what's considered off-premise advertising. So, in other words, we have a few billboards in town. Um, those billboards are legal non-conforming <laughs> uses. Grandfather is the term. But we don't allow for billboards in the city limits Prescott for, I think, I, think, I would assume for obvious reasons, it's, it's you know, it's, it's somewhat distracting. It's also an aesthetics issue. I think, I think, you know, the fundamental part of this discussion is the balance between aesthetics and, 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 and clutter and, and, you know, freedom of expression. And there, there's a sort of balance that, that um, you're sort of, as a policy body, are, at, are, are asked to find that balance. Um, you sir, and, and as you go, just to make it clear, as we go through the options that are presented in the packet, you have a do nothing option. You have a don't regulate any signage whatsoever at all, um, at least on private property. Now we do, and, and just to be also make one clarification, this is not talking about a right of way signage ban that we currently have in place um, that is a whole other story <laughs> about enforcement, but. Um, <laughs> this is talking about private, temporary signs on private property and the balance between signage in re on residential parcels versus commercial parcels. And typically, as we can imagine, um, you know, commercial signage, you're, gonna, you're, you're likely to see more signage, whether it's more the number of signs or the, the size of the signs on commercial or non-residential property than you are on, on residential property but that doesn't mean you have to go in that direction. Um, so it, it's, it's just to be clear, this is, you know, we're bringing this forward because after the council adopted the land development code um, during last year's election, our local election, we adopted a moratorium. It's a Band-Aid on, a, on, a, on a, a, a problem was sort of discovered or determined to exist after the fact. So we're bringing this back forward because uh, one thing we can tell you is the moratorium is not the answer. To, to have something in place and then to, to purposefully decide not to enforce it is not the right answer. So we're, we're looking to, 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 to either leave it in place and enforce it to get rid of it altogether or to find something else that you think is going to work? Councilman Good. A balance. Comment. Well, I agree with you. Um, if we're going to regulate or establish a statute, then we should enforce it and we should fund the enforcing. Otherwise, we shouldn't put it in place. Um, my feeling in general is when it comes to private property, um, people ought to be allowed to do what they want to do. And if they don't like signs in their neighborhood, move to a homeowners association with CCNRs that are restricted. Otherwise, uh, they should be free to to do what they want on their own private property. And the same thing for for commercial. If um, somebody's putting up obnoxious signs, the market will take care of it. They'll stop buying the product, and the sign will go away along with the business. Um, but for government to step in and start making decisions about what's a sign and what's a piece of art and how big of a sign it can be and how many is just um, not what I consider the proper function of government. Well, my concern, one, is what will we actually be able to enforce? Because it's obvious that we've not been able to enforce what we have in place right now with the right-of-way because we have hundreds of signs in the right-of-way right now. And, and I know it's, it's very complicated because the state has kind of tied our hands in some ways. 
Uh, so let's, I, I guess my concern is let's just make sure we don't put anything in place that we can't absolutely enforce. And um, for me, I agree. I agree with Councilman Good on the the private property. I, I, right now, I'm, I probably have six signs in my front yard, and um, because that's who I want to put in my front yard, and I, and I don't think we should be limiting that. Our, you know, that that is this my property and should be able to do that. And I actually live in a homeowners association, so um, I think as we, as we go forward, I think that's one thing we should at least consider. Is you know, what can we enforce on this? Billy, I'm glad to hear you say it because it is your front yard. It is. What right do I have solely because I sit here at the will of the folks to come and steal your freedom as to what you do in your private property? You know, I'm not asking you what to do on public property. We as a body have a right to make that decision. What you do on your private property is a different issue. And I have a huge concerns when we want to take and censor what you do on your private property. I've always been that way. You know, that's one of the reasons why I hated the government getting involved in art in this community, because then we want to censor art. You know, who are you to define what's art and what's not art? Councilman Shiska. Thank you. You're welcome. A couple of things. First one I want to ask John. Do we create ordinances so that when we decide to enforce them, we'll have something to enforce? No. No, I, I think... We create, we create ordinances or we or amend our code because it's deter, it, because there is determined to be some type of problem that we're trying to fix or cure or prevent from happening in the future. And oftentimes um, the, the, the last resort to, of, in the way to do that is to adopt a law that prohibits or regulates it. Um, we don't look you know, you know, we don't we don't look for something for our police department or code enforcement to do, and then go out and adopt a regulation to go. Hey, here's another function for you to to perform. We're, we're not a self-licking ice cream cone. I like that. It's a military. Well, <laughs> you know, I, I guess what I'm what I'm getting at is, you know, we we have all sorts of ordinances out there, and when we decide to enforce them then you know, we actually do something about it. But in the case of signs in the public right-of-way, we were very determined to get signs out of the public right-of-way. Right. And as you can see, what, the reason I laughed at your statement was there are not only just a few signs in public right away, but it's almost obnoxious. Three thousands. Yeah. And again, without getting into too much detail, because this is this discussion is about private property. You're, but, you're exactly right, but, but my my thing is, if we can't enforce something as straightforward as that, then how are we going to go deeper into the situation and start measuring signs on people's private property? Um, you know, George, I totally understand the situation you're in. You're just trying to make it work, and there are some signs that are so large that they actually keep you know, a, a visual line from happening. And, and that's a public nuisance as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, we have to get to a point where we actually can enforce what is, what is not only reasonable, but, but is also quite evident. And so, you know, I, I, I asked Michael, I said, why did this come up today? And is that just, it just happened to come up today, or was there a specific situation that caused it to come up today? So, I, 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 it's come up today because um, in anticipation of our, our, of our local election next year, there, there were already questions about what can I do with political signs or campaign signs on my property? And, and I, like I said before, the current land development code was, was consciously, you know, de determined not, we're not going to enforce that by way of a resolution to adopt a moratorium. It wasn't even sort of a, we're going to look the other way unofficially. So if that doesn't work, then we should do something different. 
differently. So if we're going to do something differently, then what is that? What does that look like? And that's kind of the discussion for today. That's why we brought it to a study session. This, this did go to planning commission um, uh, two weeks ago, something like that. A little and over so a week the, ago. The whole purpose is to discuss this as much as we can before we adopt something, because we did go through a pretty vigorous process last time yes. to adopt this. And the first time we're going to put it, you know, put it to work, it's like, oh, no, that doesn't work. <laughs> so we have to come back to the drawing mm -hmm. board and we're going to, you know, see what it is you think or what it is that you think as policymakers is going to be the is the best option. There's no perfect option, so what's the best option? The best of the worst option? I don't know if it's worst, but again, I think it's a question of, of you know, do you, and, and if it is, let's just get rid of regulating temporary signs on private property. Is that going to apply both to residential and commercial, or are you going to distinguish between the two? Because if you get rid of all regulation of temporary signs on private property, the Circle K or the Maverick or the Fries can blister the property with every every possible number of and, and size of temporary signs. The only thing that I'm concerned about, John, is, is not that we're doing this. It's that we can enforce whatever we do. And and so, you know, if we and, and the getting back to the other situation that we're not talking about today, if we can't even enforce that. What would lead us to believe that we could enforce this? Well, and again, I think there is a distinction between uh, signs on private property and signs in the right of way, and, and the mayor pro tem brought it up, is that we do have some of our hands tied by a state law that says we can't remove, deface, alter, or cover up signs in the right of way, subject to all these exceptions or all these rules. Um, now, I, I will say that despite the number of signs that are out there, our code enforcement folks have been out mo removing signs that don't comply with the rules. So, so yeah, so, so the number of signs that are out there now is fewer than what was out there before because we have removed signs that didn't have, for instance, the contact information or signs that were obstructing right. um, visibility at intersections that presented a hazard or signs that created an ADA issue. We've we, our code enforcement folks have gone out and removed those. The fact that they, it doesn't look like it tells you that there's a ton of signs out there. Now, we'll also say something that's probably pretty self-evident in that when you have a local election, you know, it, it's it's relatively easy. There's a relatively small group of people, all of the campaigns are local. Um, when you have an election like we have one now, which I don't think anybody's ever really seen before, you've got all this money from independent expenditures that are from all over the country. And, and so right now we can't remove those. We can, we can still ban them, and, and, but it takes, you know, you have to send a letter, you have to cite, you have to bring them to court. So there's a, it's, a very, it's a process. So one of the solutions, I guess, for the right-of-way thing, again, a little bit off topic, is if we're going to do this, if we're going to, if we're going to, if we want to enforce our right of way sign rules, we're probably going to need to bolster up our code enforcement at least during the campaign season, and have somebody specifically assigned to sign, you know, ordinance regu uh, enforcement. That's kind of a live and learn yeah. type conclusion. I'm, this isn't, you know, so at at the same time when you have signs on private property, there's no state law that sort of ties our hands. If 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 it violates the city zoning code then we can go ahead and ask, it, ask that it be removed or we can cite just like anything else in our zoning code. But again, so I think what we're... But, but we couldn't go on to private property and remove a sign. Not, we can, no, we can ask them to remove it. And if, and, and if, 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 if it violates a land development code, um, just like we would do on almost all of our code enforcement actions, we ask them to cure the problem, fix the situation. And if they don't, then we have essentially a citation authority to go ahead and, and bring them into court to either fine them or get a court order to tell them to remove it. So again, it goes back to the question of is what do you want to do if it's, if it's we don't want to regulate temporary signs at all, then the simple question is, is do you want to do that for both residential and non-residential or do you want to distinguish between the two? You know, and, and if that's kind of the direction, we probably sort of need to talk about the collateral damage or unintended consequences of that, too, because, you know, that's going to be, that could be a potential clutter. Well, I, I think that would be a great conversation to have. Unintended consequences are, are what bites us all the time. 
So, you know, I appreciate your perspective, gentlemen. Councilwoman thank Show, you. thank you for your patience. No problem. How often has this been an issue? Like, how often has this been enforced, or has someone complained about a sign? Is every year when there's an election. <laughs> in other words, every year we have, every in, in November or in the fall, August, November, we have an election, right? We have the even numbered years, which are the statewides, um, and then we have, uh, or and, and county, and then we have the odd numbered years, which are the city elections. So when it comes to temporary signs, for the most part, the Jesus save sign that's in somebody's front yard isn't, isn't going to get any attention. Um, or the impeach whomever, you know, that can be, that's a, it's, a, it's an issue, it's considered an issue sign rather than a political sign. Um, but it's, it's generally during the election season. And then, of course, we have four election periods throughout the year. So, but the big one is the even numbered year in the fall, which two years from now it's going to be a presidential election. So you can imagine the number of signs that are going to be out in about two years from now. One year from now, we have a local election. Um, obviously, the, the number of issues, the number of candidates, nowhere near what we see today. So, but it's, 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 I think it's every year in the fall you're going to see some issue, complaint, something about temporary signs, temporary political signs for the most part. The rest of the year, not much of a problem, although when it comes to right-of-ways, we have a lot of our events putting signs in the right-of-way as well. Um, and that's, but again, that's an enforcement issue. I think our right-of-way ban is, is, is enforceable, legally defensible. We just need to have the resources to go and enforce it, particularly when you see this spike between about June and November <clears throat> during election cycle. Councilman Lamerson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to kind of go along with what Councilman Shishka was saying with regards to public health and safety. You know, you know, there's a difference between presenting to the public what's safe and what's not safe. If I want to put a 40-foot re-elect Mangarelli sign in my yard and obstruct how you can go up and down on Copper Basin, that's not quite the same thing as putting a 4x4. Four four. That's what we should be paying attention to, what's safe, not necessarily content or anything else. If it's not safe, it doesn't belong there. And that's where I'm at. And I've always been there. And I think that's what I heard Shiska say. You know, at the end of the day, if it's not safe, that's where we want to regulate. What we don't want to regulate is content or interpretation or art or anything else. And to a degree, we've done that. Um, again, specifically in relation to private property, the maximum square footage of the individual signs are limited, but we don't limit how many of them you can have. So you can put up as many campaign signs or as many yard sale signs as you wish to put. The limitation on the square footage was more well, of an what issue creates with a public health or safety issue. And if you put 40 signs up on one lot, come on, George, use your common sense. Are you advocating that we restrict the number of signs on the lot? Because what I'm that's saying the is if it creates a public health or safety issue, that's what you regulate. All right. And 40 signs would create that. All right, and that's why you have code enforcement officer. They have the legal expertise to go out and say this creates a public health or safety issue. But, but they can't just do it without having an ordinance to back you. And that's kind of what we're trying to work towards, something that's enforceable. And we do consider the enforceability of something before we bring it to you. We really do. Sometimes we're uh, handcuffed, constrained by uh, state preempting us in the case of the campaign signs in the right of way that's a state preemption that in fact probably doesn't conform to the Supreme Court decision and could possibly be overturned someday Mr. Attorney, but at this point it does is the city precluded from telling a private property owner of somebody's <laughs> creating a public health and safety nuisance on their private property that we can't enforce that if if you're talking about signs that say block a sight line at an inner, at a corner, um, we could adopt something in our land development code, for instance, that would allow us to require it to be removed. I mean, in other words, it doesn't matter what the sign says, it doesn't matter how big it is, it doesn't matter when it's up, if it creates a sight line or a visibility problem, uh, and we could go down the list of those sort of traffic-related 
issues. Um, you know, we could we could create an ordinance that, that's as simple as only if it creates that or creates an ADA problem with accessibility, for instance, which is the state law even allows us to remove political signs during the season. So, you know, but I I'll give you an instance. I'm not I'm not arguing with you, but if somebody put up a bunch of one by one signs and put a hundred of them in their yard, it just planted them in their yard it, it may it may not be a health and safety issue because it may be it, it doesn't block visibility it may be somewhat distracting but if you put up a hundred garden gnomes <laughs> well, you know, yeah, so well, what you know what's the difference the fine art and that was my point <laughs> fine art. If it, yeah if, if it creates a public health and safety issue we already have the prerogative in place you can't do that well we under have, the name of freedom of speech I, I think we'd still have to do we'd have to amend our land development code if if our temporary sign regulation is going to be something as basic as you know, it can't create a, a accessibility problem. It can't create a, a sight line visibility issue to, or something like that. Then that's a, we still have to do an ordinance that would say that this is our, this is how we regulate temporary signs only for these very limited purposes. Um, but that means that if you wanted to put a, and we would still just be clear, we would still regulate commercial signs so kind of by content we would still prohibit or could still prohibit commercial signage on residential property we don't want somebody putting up a domino's pizza billboard on the side of their house necessarily i mean maybe we do maybe we don't i i mean that's really your call but and we also would still try and regulate or prohibit i think billboards because because i'm i'm kind of a, making an assumption that we don't want to see an, a a, a proliferate a glut of billboards that are built in the city so we would still we could still prohibit that sort of off-premise advertising um you know but for t for and, and billboards a permanent structure so it, it wouldn't necessarily apply but so there are certain sort of maybe baseline issues like it, you know not regulating the number of signs not regulating the aggregate square feet maybe regulating the size of any one particular sign on a residential property maybe not um but certainly, I think we could regulate no commercial advertising on the on the residential property, with the exception of a real estate sign, which is a commercial sign, right? So, um, or a for sale sign of some sort. So, I mean, we'd have to, it, it, there's some intricacies that we'd have to deal with, but um, you know, it, it's one of those things where I still think we need. And then what we would still do is is really sort of focus on those sightline issues. Um, you know, we would I, I, we in the under the time, place, and manner, we probably would want to prohibit signs that have lighting, noise, movement, flashing lights, those kinds of things. So it, it's those things I think can be construed as as basic health and safety type rules. You know, because it's, again, it's it's somewhat distracting, particularly in a residential neighborhood. Then you have to ask the question: Well, do you do that in a commercial zone? Regulate lighting, noise, movement on the sign. Um, so those are the questions. So if you're, if you're coming down to, we really don't want to regulate the number of signs. We really don't want to regulate the aggregate square footage of signs, uh, whether it's residential or commercial. We really don't want to require permits. I mean. If we're going to issue permits, are we going to charge a fee? All those kinds of things. But if we're talking about, you know, the very basics, I think we're talking about those things. Um, and then again, is there a distinction? Is there going to be a distinction that you want to see between how we treat residential property versus commercial? Councilman Blair. I wasn't going to get too deep in the weeds, but. <clears throat> I can see I'm going to get there. Um, I see a lot of different things that we need to talk about. And one of them, you know, Billy, I appreciate the fact that you have signs of who you support in your yard, but I may be the guy next door that doesn't want to see the garbage either. And I have property rights too. So that becomes an issue. And not that I'm saying one way or the other, the guy across the street from me may be politically bent in a different direction than I do. And I don't want to see him have 12 signs in his yard because that's not my stance. But again, you're regulating people. I think when you start talking about regulations and the world we live in today, Mr. Lamar, I hope you're hearing this because we need to have three code inspectors, maybe four. We need to take care of cleaning up the mess before we write, a, write rules because all the rules that we write, and if we can't enforce them, everybody just laughs at you. 
We got the Save the Dells people putting banners up all over the city right away. We got our own folks out there and Steve Gottlieb putting signs all over the city right away. They don't have permits, I suspect. They're not paying a fee, I suspect. We have banners all over this town that aren't paying a fee, I suspect. Uh, right across from Fry's on Fair Street, there's a little restaurant right there. It's got five sandwich boards in the right of way on the sidewalk. You know, if we're not going to regulate these things, let's not write a code. But if we're going to regulate them, let's regulate them, clean up this town, and have somebody enforce the doggone things. I can live with anything, but we've got to be able to enforce it. I want, and I have to say, last word, I was in Pine Top a couple weekends ago. Thank you, Joe. And I think you would admit, up in Pine Top, Heber, and th those areas up there, you see very little signage in their right of ways, hardly any political signs. So the question becomes is why do they have codes that are different than ours? Are they regulating theirs? I don't know what that answer is, but I think we have to look at state law based upon them meddling in our business once again, which aggravates me to no end. If we want our city to look a certain way, state law shouldn't preempt how we want our city to look. And I think we have to start with state law, first of all, and then ask this council what is that we want to see. And if we want to see a, a, a law or ordinance or code, then we have to give Mr. Lamar the right to hire the people to enforce it. That's just that simple. Mm -hmm. Councilman Siska. You know, it seems like we always talk about budget and money when it's, you know, when, when we talk about have this situation. And so, you know, having a, you know, square footage on a sign would almost be ridiculous in comparison to if, if a guy from, you know, community development, when he's out inspecting homes, comes up to a corner and looks to see oncoming traffic and he can't see oncoming traffic because of a sign, that sign is going to be a whole lot easier to take down than if we're asking the code enforcement guy or the de community development guy to get out of the vehicle, go measure the sign, and then get back into his vehicle and, and, and head down the road. So we need to walk before we run on this situation from my standpoint. Let's do stuff that we can enforce and that we can do in a reasonable manner and start there. I mean, like Lamerson says, just saying. <laughs> Sharing it with you. <laughs> Councilwoman Scholl. Uh, thank you, Mayor. A couple things that popped in my head is, is how to handle, you know, like our neighbor was getting a new roof and they had that roofing company sign in their yard. You know, is that allowed? Or the guy that stands on the corner and spins the subway sign. That's you know, things like that. So I think you know, I'd be interested to see what other communities are doing. I mean, I, I'm, we're not gonna, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. So let's just let's just look elsewhere and, and, we, and try to find something that's workable for us. We've done a lot of research. Yeah, we are, we aren't doing anything that isn't or hasn't been done before in terms of regulating temporary signs, and a lot of it depends on the community. Um, you know, some communities are more restrictive. And some are less. I mean, if you go down to Phoenix, there's very mm. little sign regulation. Um, you go to Except Scottsdale, in Scottsdale, where there's a lot, a of, lot sign of sign regulation, signs. or Sedona. Uh, <laughs> so, it's sort of where do you want to be in that spectrum? Um, the, the sign spinning thing is, comp is another one where the state said we can't prohibit them. No. So, it, it's not even considered a temporary sign. It's so that's a whole different animal, but. Um, so I think I think that it, we're not. I, I, I don't think we're recreating the wheel. I think what we're sort of doing here is starting the discussion. Uh, we may not finish the discussion today. Um, it doesn't sound like we're even close. But kind of you know. But we need to have this discussion because if we want to do something mm -hmm. in anticipation of our next election, which is a rough, less than a year from now, you know, we should have this discussion. It's going to go to. It, it's already been the planning commission. It's going to UDC next week. So there's going to be. You know, a, a number of opportunities for this this council and the public to comment, um, and and to sort of, I guess, come up with the best solution. Because I, I, I think it is a, it's a problem. Because if it weren't, it probably wouldn't be here. And the problem is, is we adopted a sign code, a, a temporary sign ordinance in the land development code that when we when we went to implement it, nobody liked it. Nobody thought it was it was workable. 
So we adopted the moratorium, and so now we're here so that we can come up with a more permanent solution. And I, and I would point out that in adopting that new code, we not only address the concerns about being in conflict with the Supreme Court's determination of freedom of speech regulation, but we also significantly reduced the amount of regulation we had on the books. The old sign code was far more complex than what we replaced it with. Obviously, other things need to be addressed, need to be discussed and determination of what can, what should we regulate. So the next step is the Unified Development Code Committee. That's a, a vetting body that was created by this council way back in the late 1990s when we were still, um, when we were just initiating the writing of the Land Development Code. That body's purpose is to have this discussion amongst the planning commissioners and the city council and come up with a set of solutions. And as mentioned by the city attorney earlier, the solutions range from don't regulate temporary signs to enact a whole series of regulations of temporary signs. The good news so far is that regulation of signage on private property has not been preempted by the state. We do still have local controls there. Um, rights of way, it's a different matter altogether, and again, um, with, with that added layer of complexity, it's very hard to enforce that rule. We, we do take into account what kind of impacts we're going to have on um, the enforcement process. That will be part of the UDC's discussion. We have a meeting scheduled for the 30th, that's next week, at 9.30 a.m. in here, I believe, for the initiation of that discussion. I seriously doubt we're going to get through all of the potential options and have some kind of an ordinance ready to bring back to council anytime soon, but at least we start the process and we can get public input on the process. It is important. We did that with the last code adoption, but some of the consequences that came out of that adoption affected a particular part of the use of temporary signs that we explicitly tried not to introduce, political signs. Uh, again, that's content. We try not to regulate by the content. And, and because of that, council legitimately said, whoa, let's take another look at this. Maybe there's a better way to do it or there are more ways to do it. We've gone through a series of reviews of different sign codes across the area, anywhere from Flagstaff to the Phoenix area. Um, they run the entire gamut of way more regulation than we have to way less regulation than we have. So there are middle grounds somewhere out there that we can find that's going to be acceptable to local community that addresses both aspects of sign control, safety and aesthetics, because aesthetics plays a part in your determinations up sure. here. You do it every time you make a decision. We want to make sure that we're giving you the best options available to choose from, and that's what the UDC Unified Development Code Committee meetings should result in. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. Well, certainly I believe the time is right for us to be discussing this because before you know it, we already have people campaigns that are looking at what can we and what can we not do next year. So I think, and the last time when we passed that code, it was like right on the heels of people putting signs up so it created a lot. That's how that moratorium went in. I remember that. So it seems like with the residential, the, the bigger issues are, is it, are they safe? Um, is it, um, you know, basically this is private property, so uh, should they be able to do what they need to do as long as what they're doing is not obstructing or hurting, kind of like Councilman Lamerson said. And I think the commercial is a different animal altogether. And, and I think maybe if we spend a lot of time thinking, talking about that as well, um, you know, and I know the mayor, and, and mayor, maybe you want to talk about the entertainment district, but, um, you know, commercial, how many signs, you know, also the market drives some of that. Do you want to go into a business that's got 100 signs around it? Probably not. It's probably look pretty bad. So I, I think market comes into play there. But I think residential, I would like to see us be very limited on what we limit on residential, just because people look at their property as their property. And as long as it's safe, then I, I think we need to be really careful there. Thank you for that. Yeah, and just real quick, my comment 
would be uh, in regard to the entertainment district, if there's a way to put a specific restriction on the entertainment district in terms of the aesthetics, George, you're talking about, I would like to see the, the entertainment district be more free of signs than our other areas of the city. Uh, but that's more or less from a aesthetics perspective. I'd rather not see a bunch of temporary signs down in the entertainment district. I don't want to have any negative unintended consequences for businesses who have sandwiches, sandwich signs or whatever, but uh, that was just my comment on the entertainment district. Councilman Siska. Thank you, Mayor, and welcome back, by the way. Thank you. Um, how do we know where public rights of way are? It's hard to answer the question in some cases because our rights of way vary in width across the town and across the type of streets they are. There is a significant problem with trying to determine that in some residential areas where you may have landscaping and you may have your mailbox and you may have a number of other features that look like and you treat them like your yard, but they may lie within our right of way. Generally speaking, there are some rules that we use to help determine that. Ultimately, surveying is the only way to do it and marking those things. I don't think we want to drive up and down and draw blue lines along the edge where we own it and the private property owner owns the other side of it. So there's some discretion that's necessary on the part of the code enforcement officers or the building inspectors or the planners as we're out there to make that determination. Utility poles, utility boxes, there are clues we use. But as far as a hard line, there aren't any. Well, I guess from my standpoint then, how do you know where not to put a sign? Again, we give recommendations based on those clues. If you're so many feet off of a sidewalk, generally speaking, you're gonna be on private property. Not always, generally. Sometimes the edge of the sidewalk is the edge of the private property. Sometimes it may be no sidewalk. Um, now you have to look for utility poles or the little unisource boxes that uh, show up on the property lines. They're okay. clues, but there aren't any hard lines drawn on the ground that you can tell. Okay. So there is discretion necessary, and we've been exercising discretion in the enforcement of temporary signs most recently and in, in looking at whether it's a right-of-way sign or not by making those assumptions. Roughly this far off of a sidewalk, you're okay. Closer than that, you're probably not. But again, there are no hard lines. Okay, thank you. It's a good question. It gives you a window into what the public has to deal with. I know I dealt with that on my campaign, not knowing exactly where I can put a sign. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of... Trial and error. Uh, Councilman Larson. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, <laughs> your private property rights, stop at your private property line. Anything else you expect above and beyond that is intruding upon somebody else. It's just that simple. And you know, while in a lot of principle, I agree with a lot of what's been said here. Fact is, there's a lot of people that dress differently than I like. A lot of people that have a physical appearance differently than I like. But at the end of the day, I'm expected to tolerate what they choose to do. That's who they are. When it comes to my private property, I would expect somebody to respect my property rights to do on my property unless I'm impeding somebody's health and safety. That's a different issue. But unless that's the case, they need to keep their nose out of my private property rights, just like I keep my nose out of theirs. I don't have a right to go impose my will on somebody else. And that's what private property rights is about. Whether it's you physically, whether it's your business, whether it's your home, whatever the case is, we do not have the ability to go and steal somebody else's freedom just because we don't like the way they look, or we don't like the way their house looks, or we don't like the way their business is. People have a right to pick and choose. If they don't like who I am, they don't come in my store, and there's people that will not, all right? And it's just the price you pay for being who you are, all right? And that's the way that works. At the end of the day, I don't have the freedom to steal from somebody else their right to be free either. And I just, I wanna share that because that's, a, we're sitting here talking about, you know, George, I, I really add, Meyer, who you are because you're really trying to accomplish something. I mean, you didn't put this on the chopping block. Somebody asked you to. The fact of the matter is, you know, being a paid public servant, 
you're going to do what you got to do. You're going to bring it forward. But I'm not going to tell you the way to look. I'm not going to tell you who you should be. I'm not going to tell you where to go or anything else. What I will tell you is don't tell me. Councilman Blair. Well, again, I'll go back and make my last statement in the fact that I think it has to do more with enforcement. When you take city property, uh, and, and I consider it city property, the chain link fence around the fairgrounds, the rodeo grounds, and you have a proliferation of signs that are on public property. Those are illegal. I don't care how you cut it. Or whether you have them along Iron Springs Road on a fence that's along the sidewalk that the city put up for public safety, and now I have signs all over every inch of that fence. That's on our property. Those are illegal. And for us to have a moratorium, okay, great. But they've taken it to the nth degree. I'm a Cormick Street on Unisource fence. They got signs all over Unisource's fence. You know, we need to have a code enforcement person. You don't even have to question those. You don't have to question whether they're in the right of way. You don't have to question if they're on public property. It's illegal to have them there. Get them down. And when we don't have people that take care of what we have in place now, shame on us. So I hope whatever we do here, we start paying attention to what's real and what's not real. Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, so George, one thing we haven't talked about, and that's permit fees on commercial. Is that, I, I didn't see that anywhere in any of the materials. Is, you're not recommending? No. Um, we did last. This is a test. Are we testing? Better vacate. Recess. Yeah, we'll just recess for a minute. Oh, there they go. Somebody turn it off. <laughs> it's nice tear. No. Kevin Dorf's messing with us out there. Wait, waited through the smoke and pushed the Chief reset. Light was in here a minute ago. <laughs> so I, I guess my question, the last time we actually were talking about permit fees as well. You're not at, recommending that this time? We're not. At the last time, we were actually also working through a whole series of fee resolutions almost simultaneously. Fees are established by a whole set of different regulations that, that you adopt independent of these types of, of regulations. So what about permits? Are you recommending permits um, be obtained? We have not made a recommendation one way or the other. Okay. One of the options is to allow for the, the current language and the current code that requires permits for commercial properties okay. to still apply, but it's only one of many options. So that may come out of the options you see ultimately after the UDC does their, their review. Thank you. Councilman Lamerson. Thank you. Here again, I want to uh, tailgate Councilman Blair. We're a municipal corporation deemed by the Supreme Court of the United States of America. Corporations are the same as people. We as people, that being the city, who has a board of directors, that being the seven dwarfs up here, you know, we have a right to pick and choose what happens on our property, which is municipal property. Hence the fence that Councilman Blair was referencing, okay? And what we've said is we do not want your private property on our private property, okay? We've said that loud and clear. That needs to be enforced, okay? I agree with Councilman Blair. If we can't enforce that on one, you can't enforce it on all. Or you're gonna enforce it on one, then you're gonna enforce it on all, all right? And at the end of the day, as a municipal corporation, we, the board of directors, have the right to say you cannot put your private property on our municipal property. And that's where this all came from. Private property is different. Street. My private property, I'm the board of director. Street, street right? lights. That's different. Light poles, it doesn't matter. If they're on there, they're gone. You know, and we need to be prepared to take care of that, Mr. City Manager. The fact of the matter is, this body has made. I got it. We'll pull them. Thank you. Sir. Do we have public comment? Yes, Mayor, I have one card. Sandra right. Smith. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council. We've been down this road before. <laughs> um, when it comes to right-of-way visibility, the ordinance says five feet for on private property for the height. 
that's not good for alternative mobility people, for kids, even for drivers in low riding cars. You can't see around a five foot sign if it's near the corner. So there needs to either be a different height regulation or a restriction in how close it can be to a corner or a driveway or other place where you need to see around <laughs> for that. And the sandwich boards, you're gonna love this, I know. But those sandwich boards are really a pain in the butt for people to not navigate around in the downtown area. Um, I have encountered some out further where they were put in the middle of the sidewalk, put in the middle of the, the crossing ramps, mm -hmm. and I've gone and asked the people who put them there if they could please relocate them because of the obstructions, and they have done so. So that has, you know, that does work too. But there needs to be some kind of indication for people that, you know, this is not a good thing, you can't do that. Thank you. S Sandra, Sandra, can I ask you a question? Sure. Okay. Somebody who's mobility challenged as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. I find it very offensive that we would, by ordinance, require private property owners to maintain city right of way with regards to public health and safety, with regards to debris on a public sidewalk or a public right of way, such as snow and gravel, et cetera. But when you have garbage piled up in front of somebody's business, that happens to also be private property that impedes people from transgressing. I find that very offensive. And there should be some accommodation made if, for example, in front of my shop, if somebody wants to put their private property billboards and those little sandwich boards and all that stuff, mm -hmm. I should have the right to take that down. I'm required to maintain the sidewalk. If the sidewalk's not safe because they put these things in front and people have to walk around them, I should be able to go out there and take that down. Now, I'm asking you as a citizen who's mobility, mobility challenged, what do you think of that response, whether it's me or somebody else, when we're adjacent to a public right of way, should we have the freedom as private property owners, business owners, to take down what's been put that impedes people's ability to ingress and egress up and down the public right of way? Well, if somebody else had put it on your property, I'd think you'd have the right to move it anyway. It's not my property, it's public sidewalk. Public sidewalk. That I'm required but, to take care of. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, they're, they're definitely, because the obstructions, and I know the ADA has their regulations, but I also know their regulations don't exactly work. Yeah, thank you, Sandra. So. Just real, clear, real quickly, uh, to clarify, our, our, the sandwich, our, our right-of-way code does allow for, in the downtown business district, not the entertainment district, because we didn't have it at the time, for one sandwich board within a within a certain size limit height and width right. to be placed in front of a one one sign in front of a building so for instance bradford court sorry bashford court you have one sign one sign maximum for that building it, it the location of which has to be on the outer edge of the sidewalk and to to avoid the obstruction so if someone if someone else puts a sandwich board sign out in front of that business building, that business is certainly allowed to remove it, um, relocate it, or do something with it. Because again, it's, it's the, the sign has to be attached to the, to the building for which it's advertising. Thank you, John. I did solicit a response and you did very well. So we are empowered to go take those signs down. Any other public comment? No, Mayor. So George, you have uh, marching orders here? <laughs> Clear direction. I appreciate it. Uh, we, again, we're, we're just initiating the conversation with you so you know what's going on. The next step is the Unified Development Code Committee. They meet next week, the 30th. They're going to start the discussions. Uh, three council members and four planning commissioners are on that body. It is a public meeting. It's advertised. It's open. Anyone who wishes to come and participate is certainly welcome to do so. Thank you. Thank you, George. And as a follow-up from an enforcement perspective, it sounds like there's clear direction to go out and where there's a clear violation, we will pick up the sign starting now. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Goodman's got that. All right. By, who, by whomever. Trash men, garbage men, the fire department's not doing anything now. 
Let's move on to the next uh, item, which is discussion of mobile food truck and mobile merchant regulations. So let's see if this works. Yeah, you may, Mayor, if you may hit the light. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, I, I, want, I know all of you have this. It's in the packet, this ordinance, but I wanted to put it up there for uh, the benefit of our TV viewing audience and, and our audience and who's here now. So a little bit of background. Um, again, in, in reaction or in response to a relatively new state law, um, in, in the past couple of years, we've had state laws come in and tell us we have limited ability to regulate vacation rentals, for instance, or limited ability to regulate Uber Lyft type uses. Um, we have limited ability to regulate signs in the right of way. Well, now we have limited ability to regulate mobile food vendors or other sort of mobile, mobile merchandise sellers um i think the, the the limitation is is we can't prohibit them anymore but we can adopt some level of reasonable regulation so the purpose of today's discussion is to is to decide or to not to decide but to discuss where do we want to see if at all some regulation come down when it comes to these mobile mobile vendors whether they're food or, or merchandise um what, what, I, what we presented to you today is in in big pictures kind of a, a layered approach to, to regulation. So the, 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 the layer with the least level of, of local regulation would be a mobile, mobile vendor or mobile food truck on commercial private property or non-residential private property. There's a certain, they, they, they have to meet certain standards, um, but it's sort of the, would be considered the least regulated of the three. The next layer down would be, or up, would be um, mobile food vendors or mobile merchandise on residential private property. Fairly restrictive, um, a time limit, um, primarily probably for some type of special event is, if you think about it that way. Um, the next then where we regulate a little bit more is mobile food vendors on city rights of way. We can't prohibit mobile food vendors or mobile sellers on rights of way, but we can adopt some level of regulation. We can require a permit. We can require insurance, naming the city as an additional insurer. We can require them to follow all the parking laws that are in place um, and some other things I'll go through. And then sort of last but not least, where we have the highest level of regulation in this draft is city-owned property that's not right-of-way. City hall parking lot, our parks, our parks parking lots, um, other city property where if a mobile vendor wants to um, do business from a city lot, um, the, the, this draft would say you have to come in and get an agreement with the city, um, you have, and then you have to pay the city some type of rent uh, for the use of the city property. Uh, you have to provide insurance, and we may have a, and other restrictions. So I'll kind of go through that, but it, that's the context within which um, we're going to discuss some things. So I'm not going to go through this page by page. I know we have somewhat of a limited time. Um, but I'll, I'll sort of start with in definitions on page three, legal parking space. Um, so obviously it's, you know, you have, to def <laughs> you have to define what a parking space is, right? So um, a legal parking space means a parking space in the city right away that's marked by two white lines. I mean, obviously fairly obvious. Um, the one thing I, I could tell you based on, I've gone to a couple of, conferences and things about food van mobile food vending is that mobile food vendors don't like diagonal parking for obvious reasons you can't really queue up if you're your customers because you know they're they're used to queuing up on the sidewalk not in an, in another in another parking spot so um, and, and so diagonal parking creates kind of a, a, a particular problem for, for mobile vending. Um, but legal park space does not include a parking space in a parking lot or property owned by the city by that definition. So that means like city hall parking lot, um, a park, a parking lot for a park or, or a ball field or something like that. So we're, again, we're going to, we, we have to allow for the f uh, mobile vending you know, on legal parking spaces, but those are parking spaces in the right of way. We, we also go ahead and define what a mobile food unit is, a mobile vendor, a mobile merchant, 
which is somebody who sells something other than food, because there, there's a different layer of regulation that we don't necessarily impose, but that the food vendors have to meet. In other words, county health permits, uh, Department of Health safety, food handler cards, fire inspections, those kinds of things. So we have to sort of make those distinctions. Hey, John. Yes, sir. From a legal perspective, is there a difference between allow for it and provide for it? Is there a legal difference between allow for it and provide for it? I mean, I can understand the concept of allowing freedom, but I don't necessarily think that I think it's government's responsibility to provide it. I mean, they have a right to be here, but I don't have to make accommodations for them to be here. You see what I'm saying? I, I do. And, and that's where we're talking about, it, 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 again, if, if, if our if our local um, mobile vendors want to be on commercial private property, I, this proposes very little regulation. Obviously, you have to have the permission of the property owner um, and some some written proof of that. There's a time limit within which somebody could stay there. I think it's we'll get to that 96 hours. But if you're on the city streets, or certainly if you're on a city other city owned property, we we, we can allow for it. We don't have to provide for it. I think if that's what you're asking. Yeah. Okay. That, that's sort of where I was coming from. For example, you know, you see a lot of these things come around the courthouse square during the different times of right. the year and et cetera, and they're all over the street. We allow for it, but we don't have to provide all the amenities for them to, to do certain Correct. things. Correct. Right. And we'll, and we'll get to that in a little bit when we talk about on street or right of way type use. We can't prohibit it, I guess, is the, is the other, is what's important to note. We can't prohibit mobile vending on city streets. So um, I know you may get pushback from some of our brick and mortar uh, retailers or food service providers, but at the same time, we can't, the state law says we can't prohibit it. And unfortunately, we're sort of stuck with that, um, that rule. So a couple of things is it's, it's that, you know, a food vendor has to obtain the health services um, license um, to operate. Um, if, again, these, this is the, what we're sort of proposing, I guess. If a food vendor is going to operate in a city right of way, meaning in a parking, in a legal parking space at a city right of way, uh, we're suggesting they have to get a permit. It would be an over the counter permit. They have to provide certain basic information. Um, it's a one year permit. And, and the reason we'd want to ask for that permit, and, and uh, let me back up a little bit. Some cities are looking at fingerprinting and a very in-depth kind of, and I, I suggest we stay away from that. The reason we want the permit, we want them to get a permit with some basic information, as you can see here, um, is that we're gonna, we also want to require that they provide us with proof of insurance, naming the city as an additional insured. If you're going to operate a business on a city street, the state, the law says that we can require them to provide us insurance. The only sort of mechanism to catch that is, is require some type of permit to be on the street. Um, as you can see here, I left blank um, what department would be sort of issuing the permit. And, and also, we're gonna, you'll see later, left blank what the fee should be. It should, there should be probably a nominal fee to, to handle it. Is it $10? Is it $15? We can kind of make that recommendation as we go. Why but wouldn't it be commensurate to what you charge people for permission to be here to begin with? Um, in order for me to function in the downtown area, I get charged a fee for permission. They, okay. They have to also have a, a, we'll get to license. They also have to have all appropriate licenses, TPT license, a business license, um, the, the uh, county health license, mm -hmm. Department of Health Service license, they also have all those other licenses that they, they have to comply with. So this would be, again, they're operating a business in the city, they have to comply with all, all licensing requirements, whether it's county health, Department of Health, um, city business license, TPT license. But if you're gonna operate on a city street, you, you're, you're, you're distinguished then between somebody who has a brick and mortar restaurant, you're not operating on the city street, so you're, you're doing your business on the street, we can require a permit to make sure we, we, we can track that, but primarily so that we, we get the copy of the insurance so that we're protected in case something happens, you know, to one of their patrons, food poisoning or get hit by a car or something. We want to know that we have the city, 
you know, to protect the city assets, um, that we have insurance that would be primary to our, our risk pool insurance if something were to happen and we were, the city were to be named as, as a party in that case. Again, we can't prohibit it, but we can regulate it. So that's the insurance. Um, we, we, we suggested there in an amount established by the city attorney's office, essentially what we usually look for is what's called the 1 million, 2 million. It's a 1 million per occurrence, 2 million aggregate. That's usually sufficient and satisfies the risk pool. Um, if they're doing something, if, if we have vendors on city property, they're doing something sort of high risk and believe it or not, jump, jumpy houses or high risk, we require higher insurance because there's the likelihood of injury. But for food service, it's probably 1 million, 2 million. Um, again, and getting the, the, the permit or the license from County Health. Um, so there's a whole process this goes through um, to get the permit. It, 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 it's sort of designed to be essentially over the counter. Um, a question for you all to think about is do you want to have any limitations on the background of the person? Um, th and I put this in yellow because some cities are doing it. Um, and I wanted to sort of bring it up for a discussion. This type of limitation, if you see it in yellow there, is a background check. So. If we're going to have us this kind of restriction, again, I don't really need an answer, something to think about as we move forward. If we're going to do this kind of restriction, then it's going to take a background check. Well, that takes time and it takes money. So that would increase the cost of the permit to operate on a city street. No question. Um, the, one of the reasons why- Hey, John, hang on just a second. Sir. Mayor Pro Tem. No question. Do we do that with any other business? <sighs> we do with our sober homes. We have some, we have, um, we have these kinds of prohibitions. This is primarily in place for something we currently don't have, and that's the, ice, the, the, the proverbial ice cream sales truck that drives around with the really annoying music. Cities are doing this. I, I mean, I, I don't mean to sort of make light of it, but cities are doing this because the ice cream trucks are driving through residential neighborhoods, and if somebody's a sex offender and gets a hold of an ice cream truck, it's, it, it, you know, bad things can happen. So some cities are doing this primarily for the ice cream type vendors, the ice cream truck sales yeah. people, but they have to apply it across the board because the law says you can't, you know, the, the current sure. law says you can't sort of selective, select Just certain types of vendors and not others. Um, yeah. We don't have, you know, again, I'm saying this today, we don't, I don't think we have any sort of ice cream vendor trucks driving through the neighborhoods with the ding ding music. Um, so this is something that you, know, you could kind of think about, okay. but again, it, it raises the level of oversight. It, you know, we would then, if we're gonna do this, we ha you know, as Councilman Francisco likes to bring up, if we're gonna adopt a regulation, we have to enforce the regulation, which means, which means we have to do the background check and there's a fee for that, and so it raises the price of the permit from something like 10 or 15 to maybe 50, 60 dollars because we can, you know, we can do um, background checks electronically now. But there's a fee for it. We pay a we pay a service. Uh, we do it for all of our employees and our volunteers. Um, you know, we do this kind of background check. So something to think about as we go forward. Um, to get to Councilman Lamerson's question, licensing. So if you're going to be on a city street. You got to get a permit. If you're if you're going to operate at all, you got to be you got to be all, all the appropriate licenses you have to have TPT, business, health license, all the other things that you're supposed to have. Um, going forward, if you're going to operate at a city event or city property other than right away, then we're going to require an agreement, some type of agreement with the vendor, to make sure that um, you know we, we either get some rent payment, we get some percentage of sales or something like that. It, um, we also are gonna require obviously insurance for those people, those operators operating on city property. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit later. So operationally, if you're a mobile food vendor, you, the state law says you have to have fire inspection done. That, that doesn't necessarily mean by Prescott Fire Department, um, as long as you have proof of, of a fire inspection, um, within the last 12 months from a city fire department, then you're good. So if somebody is vending in Chino Valley and, and 
Well, actually, that probably, technically that doesn't count because the law says it has to be a city or town fire department. So a little, it's a little limited. Uh, but does it, so it excludes fire districts, although I'm not sure why. I think they just wrote it and they maybe overlooked it. But if you have a fire inspection from a city or town fire department, we have to honor that. Um, John, uh, Councilman Lamerson's got a comment. Thank you. I just wanted to give credence again to Councilman Shiska. If I remember correctly, part of the justification for in, in paneling the community with a business license fee is you want to know who's doing business here. And that was part of the reason in, in order to get a business license, they had to do a background check. We want to know who's doing business in the city limits of Prescott. All right. And I understand where you're coming from on that, whether you're transient or whether you're permanent. If you're going to do the business in the city of Prescott, we want to know who you are. Right. Yeah. And, and again, background check is a little I'm talking about criminal background check is, right. is the highlighted yellow. I guys did the same thing on the rest of us. Okay. So, again, it, it goes through some standard requirements. Um, some of the specifics, you know, and the, the, this is, most of this is to address problems or yeah, problems that we know arise from sort of other people's history with mobile food vendors. Trash is a big one. Um, so the requirement that they have at least a 15 gallon trash receptacle within 15 feet of the mobile unit, uh, that they have to haul it away. They can't just use a local sort of local trash bin or trash can on the city corner. They have to go back to their commissary to dump it. Um, those are the kinds of things. Those are probably from what I've heard from doing some of these seminars, that's the biggest complaint, believe it or not, is trash is that it gets to be a mess in the area. Um, so, so that one is, you know, is, is something that we would recommend and then also enforce. Noise is another one. This goes to kind of to signage, but um, you know, amplified music is, is just, just disturbing of the piece. Um, so we just kind of prohibit it altogether from a mobile food vendor because again, you're on, you're, you're on a city street, you're on, a, on, on private property, it's open air. And um, we're recommending that just to just to ban the amplified music or announcements or those kinds of things. They also have to provide some level of security. It's very, it's fairly general. Um, maintain in a safe and clean manner. They have to have if they're going to operate at night. They have to have some type of lighting. Again, consistent with our lighting code, so it's down pointed down, um, and, but onto the street, and so it keeps the dark skies. Um, and then another one, F3, talks about sort of accessibility issues. It, you know, the mobile vendor is going to be required to maintain his or, her, his or her queue of people so that they don't sort of gather around in a gaggle and obstruct, you know, the free flow of, of, of pedestrians on the sidewalk. Um, so that's kind of generally speaking on, on, on selling from city streets. If you go to private property, um, these are sort of the regulations on private property. Um, you could sell from commercial property as long as you have written pr proof somewhere on, on the vehicle. Um, and if one of our code enforcement folks or police officers, somebody says, I'm going to see written proof, they've got to be able to provide it to make sure you aren't trespassing. Um, the highlighted yellow is, is a limitation that says 96 consecutive hours and then you've got to move. Um, generally speaking, the industry folks are fine with that because they have to go back to their commissary to meet health code requirements anyway. And the whole idea is, is, is that we want this to be mobile, so you have to kind of come and go. Um, what this usually means, what, but this, what this doesn't prohibit though, is somebody being able to rent an exclusive space from a private property owner to say, you know, at, by way of a lease, for instance. And that private property owner says, you get to come back here, you know, every day from, you know, eight to eight or noon to midnight or whatever um, and operate from this location. But we don't want to do is have that mobile vendor there more than 96 hours, which is three day, four days. Four days. There you go. Uh, I would have been an engineer if I could do math. So um, another another limitation, and this is what's specifically allowed in state law, is we can prohibit mobile vending on the streets not only in, re in our residential zones, so, so we would prohibit that. So, so, re so mobile vending in residential zones would be prohibited and also 250 feet from the residential zone. A little tough to measure if you're downtown, but the whole idea is that you, you, know, you don't want sort of commercial 
activities encroaching in residential areas. Um, other than your proverbial ice cream seller that is going to primarily be in a residential zone. Now, we also suggest that um, a, a exception to the rule would be a six hour um, special event type use if you're gonna bring a, um, a, a mobile vendor onto, private, onto residential property, um, you can do it for up to six hours at some type of party, special event, that type of thing. So we think that's kind of a pretty good compromise. But for the most part, again, we don't want to move, you know, commercial activities into the residential areas. Um, we get back to city rights of way and other city property. So we talk about you have to get a permit to operate on the right of way. If you're going to operate on city, other city property other than a right of way, you got to enter into that agreement with us. Um, that, that essentially will have basically a form agreement we would use, just like we would use for if we were to do a special event um, at the lake. You know, we'll have, a, we'll have an agreement for all of our vendors. We'll make sure they have insurance. We're named additional insured, those kinds of things. And there may or may not be a fee, a rent price, a license fee, you know, some, some piece of the action, as it were. Um, we also specifically call out the airport, because the state law says we can. And the reason we do that is, is right now, right now we have a parking issue, um, which is good news, I guess, at the airport. So we would want to make sure we specifically call out, we, you know, with, unless you have an agreement with the airport or with the city, you can't operate there. In the future, when we have, if and when we have an expanded or new terminal and we have concessionaires in that terminal, they're going to want some exclusivity. They're not going to, you know, they're going to pay premium dollar to be located and have that sort of captured audience in that terminal. And they're not going to want mobile vendors sitting outside the door. Um, sort of selling food to travelers because these folks inside the building probably are going to pay pretty good premium because you essentially have a captured audience to sell to. Um, and this, this is more, this is a particular to kind of Sky Harbor and, and, and Tucson International, but figured let's put it in because it actually works in our favor as well. Um, parking, this is, so this is when you go back to um, parking on the right of way. You're allowed one to occupy one legal parking space, you got to follow all the rules of that parking. So if you're in the downtown area and it's a two hour limit during the week, you get two hours. If we were to ever go to parking meters, you got to pay the fee. I mean, I don't think we'll ever do that, but who knows? Um, so if you're going to, if you're going to do something that takes up more than one legal parking space, you have to enter in some sort of agreement with the city. So for instance, if we were to do, uh, somebody were to want to open up or use one of our, we wanted to do a vendor agreement or concessionaire agreement with a vendor at one of our city parks, but they needed two parking spaces. We could, we could do that as part of an agreement. Um, but again, it's, it's the city's discretion whether to enter that agreement or not. Um, if you're going to be in any kind of, uh, Diagonal parking space, 24 feet would be our max limit. Other than for Prescott purposes, if you're on Gurley, I don't think you, you have to still stay within the box. So 24 feet ain't, ain't gonna cut it. You're probably maybe 16, give or take. So I don't think we're gonna see a lot of um, mobile vending in our diagonal spaces um, and, and because they don't like diagonal unless you're the one operator that has a little trailer. What we're suggesting, however, though, is to, for safety purposes, is number four, and that is you can't operate in a diagonal space that's adjacent to another diagonal space. In other words, you have to be the, the if you're coming down the street, you got to get into that first diagonal space next to what's called the gap or a gore. Um, because if, if you're assuming you're vending windows on the right, so that if you're gonna queue up, you're gonna queue up on the sidewalk or in that little gap gore area, that cross hatched area that you, you notice, because then you're not in another parking space. So, um, because it is a, I think it is a, a very much a safety issue. Um, so that's something to kind of contemplate. Um, yeah, we, you know, obviously it's kind of common sense regulations, but we have to have them. You can't operate with the window facing the street, so you can't create effectively a drive through or a drive by. Um, you have to, um, f comply with all posted time limits 
If there's no time limit, it's six hours in a 24 hour period. So, uh, and then it goes on to say that that's any parking space within 100 feet of the one you're in. So again, so it's that we don't have sort of these semi-permanent um, occupation of, of city parking spaces. Last but not least, when it comes to parking on private property, um, and this will be adjusted in the land development code as well if we move forward, and that is, is if, if, you're, if you're a private property owner and you have, you, have, you, know, you have to have so many parking spaces, other than downtown business district, you have to have so many parking spaces to serve what you already have permanently on your, on your parcel. So if you're going to put mobile food vendors and it reduces the number of then left parking spaces left over to serve your permanent business, you can't do it. You have to leave. You have to have. A, you have to still leave, meet the minimum so you don't underpark by putting a bunch of food vendors on your um, on your parking lot. So a good example would be maybe a grocery store like a Fry's or a Safeway. Um, depending on what their parking requirement would be, they may be able to fit in one or two mobile vendors on the lot. But if they put a dozen and it reduces their parking below the land development code requirement, they, they would be stopped at some point. So they still need to par be, be able to meet their minimum parking requirements. Uh, and then the rest of it kind of goes on. Um, talk about, I mean, it, it talks about sort of the enforcement issues, which I, I won't belabor. Um, so I guess, so that's kind of concludes my, my presentation, open to your questions or discussion. Questions or comments from the council? Councilman Good. John, I looked at the uh, state law that was enacted and my understanding was that if a mobile vendor received a health permit from any county that was applicable and could be used in any other county, and I noticed your draft indicated it needed to be from Yavapai. They do have to have, they have to follow the Yavapai County. They do have to get a permit from Yavapai County for the health. They can get the state um, food handler, but it, it does, they do have to comply with county by county when it comes to the particular health. And, I, and off the top of my head, I don't know if they can just transfer, if they get stuff from Maricopa County, is it the same health code as Yavapai? Can they just transfer? But we want to see the Yavapai County health um, permit um, and, and I, I believe the state law does allow us to do that again I don't know if it's sort of you can just swap one for the other or if you get one in Maricopa County can you automatically get one in Yavapai and they, they and then the statewide um, permit is from health Department of Health Services your food handler card and those kinds of things I looked at it uh, quite a few months ago I'd have to refresh my memory other questions comments from the council any public comment no, Mayor. Yep. Yep. Okay. Oh, Sanders got one. You must have done a really good job, John. <laughs> got it done in a lot less time than George did. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mayor, Council, good afternoon. Um, it's more a question than a comment, per se. You're talking about mobile food vendors. Is this including sidewalk carts? I haven't heard one way or the other anything that indicates. Well, this includes any kind of mobile vendor, whether it's okay. a food or merchant. So, yeah. Oh, so, right away. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so just, you know, I, I can address that to you, Mayor, Council. A mobile food unit in, is a food establishment licensed by the state, readily movable, that dispenses food or beverages or for immediate service and consumption. So, for instance, we do have a... a fairly regular food vendor it's basically a trailer that's backed mm -hmm. into one of our diagonal slots so that would be that would fall within the definition uh, for a while we had sort of a hot dog cart that would sit at the corner of goodwin and and montezuma that was on private property so our current land development code had sort of this little carve out for that type of use um, this would then, and this, if we adopt this, it would go concurrently with an amendment to the land development code so that they would sync up and work together. Um, and, and obviously our current uh, allowance for the hot dog cart kind of vendor is inconsistent with what state law tells us we can do. It's too restrictive. 
So this would, um, you know, it's sort of that new economy notion. And so we're trying to kind of keep up with it. Um, right now we have really zero um, regulation on it. And so I know it goes into the, if we're gonna adopt regulation, we need to be able to enforce it. Um, so that's sort of ultimately a question. So, I, you know, if, if you have any thoughts about whether you wanna go forward with this um, and then how you're going to resource your enforcement, your city manager is sitting to my left. <laughs> any other questions, comments? Well, Mayor, I'd just like to say, so John, good job. I, um, it seems to me that what you've brought forward is something that's pretty enforceable. Well, I, I would say this, is, is that, that I, I was part of a group of League of City attorneys that after the, or during the, um, the League of Cities conference, we had our meeting and we decided let's do sort of some, a model ordinance, at least a, 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 to work from. And so this is similar to the model ordinance. We, we have, there's some tweaks that, that we, I think we do up here that may be different than what they may want to do in, in Phoenix or Mesa or Scottsdale. But, but pretty much this is con relatively consistent with what the league is putting out as kind of a model ordinance. And it has been sort of shopped to, if you will, the, the, food, the uh, Mobile Food Vendor Association. And they had a few changes, and so we've incorporated those. So they're pretty much agree. They understand they're not going to have unfettered ability to do whatever they want. They understand that they're going to have some level of regulation. So the industry is, I think, okay with this, um, this type of layer, these layers of regulation. Well, and when we have special events and all those food trucks are here, they have all of these oh, yeah. same regulations. They have to go and make sure Don Devendorf gives them a, right. uh, okay, you're good right. to go. And the health, County Health, Leslie Horton's department, they are good to go. So they have to have a business license yep. already. TPT. Yep. TPT. Right. So I think this all kind of falls in line with that. I think it's pretty easy to enforce. Good. Anything else? Yeah, Councilman Good? Yeah, I just want to make sure that the public in general understands that we're not generating this regulation um, by ourselves. It's another example of uh, our state legislature trying to control municipal activities, um, and we're kind of handcuffed being directed that you know these um, regulations um, or restrictions are being imposed on us so it's up to us to try to accommodate them as best we can so that the public in general and our commercial um, businesses are in line with the uh, state regulations so um, as most everyone knows, I'm a proponent of uh, limited regulations as much as possible. So um, as long as we understand we're not the one generating this, we're just trying to respond to the state's uh, ongoing control of our uh, local uh, ability to do business and impact our uh, citizens. Other questions or comments from the council? If not, this meeting is adjourned.